but I was stuck on that word garbage. It, I, you know, as a mother and just as a faith based person, I couldn't reconcile that in my mind. And, you know, when you talk about garbage, <laughs> a part of your child will be garbage. That's hard enough. Hey, friends, I'm Cassie, and I'm a married Spoonie who lives the chronic illness life. Here each week, I'll challenge you to live intentionally and authentically, where every spoon you use has a purpose and every step you take matters. Welcome to Chronically Cultivating. Hey, everybody. I am so glad that you are here with us today. Now, instead of just saying me, I say us because I have a very special guest. Well, I guess more like co-host. Let me introduce you to somebody really special to me. So my mom and I have been through a lot together, as most chronic illness families have. And we have just enjoyed going through this journey together as hard as it has been. And we have talked about doing a podcast for a very long time. So this is so exciting that this is finally happening. So everybody meet my mom, Deb. Hey, everybody. I'm Deb Mayo, Cassie's mom. So it is kind of cool to be here today. We are actually, if I can paint a picture for you, we're actually in the woods of Maine, northern New England. It's beautiful. And we this just... little cozy cabin. Yeah, we actually got an opportunity to be up here basically for free. We had about four days here. If you hear any noise in the background, we're actually kind of packing up to head home. And we are kind of squeezing this in while we have some time. Yeah. But it's great to meet you all. And I hope to be back on again. And mm-hmm. we just kind of have uh, Cassie's story kind of unfold. And our story as a family, really more to help other people as we kind of all go through this journey together. So thanks for having me. Yeah. So we have a story for you today. And I think it's one that everybody can relate to on some level. And I hope what's come from this story that has really changed our lives so significantly will also make an impact for you listening. Uh, So if you don't know me super well, I'm Cassie and I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome with a couple other comorbidities that come along with it. The Ehlers-Danlos causes my joints to dislocate. And we had been managing, I would say decently well up until my hip had dislocated. And that was just, that kind of blew everything out of the water And we had to start talking to surgeons. It just got very messy very fast. My husband was not really going fully to appointments with me at that time. So both my parents were with me and we were just starting the venture of understanding what had happened to my hip. And you weren't married yet. Yep, I was not married. So uh, we've been fortunate to be able to go to Boston hospitals and have access to a lot of great care. But we have quickly learned that things with EDS, dysautonomia, and such, there's really two real camps, I would say, of medical understanding for that. And mm-hmm. we are, unfortunately, we're, despite getting great care for her other issues, um, we're really kind of in a black hole <laughs> with uh, the location that we were at and just trying to piece this together as best we could, getting information and insight wherever we could. So this was a consult. Yep. And we always recommend anyway, no matter how old you are and what your life is like, it's always good to have another set of ears with you because you're going to hear things differently as a patient or uh, maybe be overwhelmed. And I should probably include in my background that I'm a nurse. So I kind of have that viewpoint. I'm a mom first, of course, at these appointments. But, you know, as a nurse, I think it's great to have someone else with you. So the story we're kind of sharing today is that consult with an ortho. And when you go for a surgical opinion, you may get a surgical opinion. So (laughs) we knew that Um, some surgeons will say, no, I wouldn't do this at this time, or this might be the road you're going to have eventually. So, you know, that's kind of where our mindset was. Mine very much was, uh, even though she was 21 years old, I don't want my baby having surgery if she doesn't need to. And the concern with EDS, of course, is it's not just a one and done. It could be a series of surgeries, depending on how that connective tissue and reconnects re- and just heals. Yeah. 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 So this was kind of new territory for us. Yeah. And we had also, it had been a very frustrating month. We had really dealt with some practitioners saying, there's no way that your hip dislocated. Mm. There's no way that it fell out of the socket 
And, you know, between Jared, who was my boyfriend at the time, and my parents, who have not only looked at the head of my femur out of its socket, have watched me pop it back in, have heard it, actually, I should say, because I don't think you would watch. I think you just heard the pop. I um, could feel it, though. You had me feel your hip. Yeah. And it's different than a shoulder dislocation, I think, too, so you should point that out, where, you know, if you think of the anatomy of the whole pelvis... Because you know, it's not completely like, hey, hanging out there, you know, lost. Yeah, and they, it's in that girdle, the hip girdle. So yeah, and they talk about how the shoulder is really like a T, like it could just mm-hmm. the ball can slip off. But they talk about the hip, and they're like, it's it's stable, it's in there, it's not just gonna like fall out. So there had also, I think, been this fear, I guess, in the back of my mind that okay, we're just gonna go to another doctor, and they're just gonna say, um, that didn't happen to you when we knew what had happened and we had seen it happen multiple times. So I think there was some anxiety. Well, every appointment brings anxiety, but I think there was a little extra anxiety there too. Well, and I think also whether it's a subluxation or a dislocation, something significant is happening with your Mm -hmm. hip, with your mobility. Uh, It was just definitely a game changer for your independence and getting around. And this is somebody who you were still driving at that point. Yep, I was driving and working. And yeah. in school, yep. Yep, so there was a lot, there was a lot at stake. So, um, you know, going to a place that we at least felt confident in going to, mm-hmm. like we, we knew this was a good practice, but there was still some anxiety. So do you want to get into how that appointment went? Sure. So we get there and we just start chit-chatting. And one of the, you know, the doctor just said right off the bat, is he was just like, you know, with Ehlers-Danlos, your ligaments are all garbage. And I think that took everybody back for a second. You know, then he continued on. He was like, I need to get some specific x-rays. But he's like, if your hip is doing that, I'm pretty sure it's dislocating. Like, I really think that that's what's happening. And I had some notes that I had taken in the appointment that I was looking at earlier. I literally wrote in all capitals, hallelujah, like someone is understanding and knows that I'm not crazy. And that was like such a big deal to me. Um, But he had explained like we needed to get certain images done and those would kind of determine my fate of what needed to happen. And I think for me, you know, also for uh, my husband as well, we got stuck on that word garbage because even though this was a very respectful doctor, don't think that he was, you know, Mm -hmm. being sarcastic. He just was very real. He would just do things in language that you know, you could understand he also worked in pediatrics. So you you can imagine he's used to dealing with all different age groups and and parents, of course. But I was stuck on that word garbage. You know, as a mother and just as a faith-based person, I couldn't reconcile that in my mind. And, you know, when you talk about garbage, (laughs) a part of your child being garbage, that's hard enough. But when you think about connective tissue and ligaments, that is throughout her entire body. This isn't just about a hip or a knee or an ankle. Not that that's not significant. This was something that's her whole being. So I I had a very hard time with that. I'm one of these people pretty much have it together most of the time. We all have our moments. And I'm fortunate that when maybe I'm stressed or anxious or fatigued, my husband can be the strong one and vice versa. And this was one of those moments where it just rocked me to my core. I was also having a little bit of anxiety because I knew the position she needed to get into for x-rays were going to be painful. X-rays always created some kind of pain for her and my husband, you know, and they were taken off to go do the x-rays. And I just, instead of just following along like I normally would, I said, you know, I, I just need a minute. And when these things happen, it's never what I expect, but I, I started calling them bathroom Bible moments because I was just like, I just need to go laser them. Like, let me just think for a sec. Let me just splash some water on my face. I, I was really trying to keep it together for Cassie, but I, I was having a very hard time with this. So before I could even pray, you know, Lord, just help me have some insight here because you you don't make garbage. Like you, you don't. You know, I this is completely conflicting with everything I believe in. So before I could even fully articulate that, I'm so grateful that immediately, you know, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am perfectly and wonderfully made just kept running through my head. And it, it goes back, I think, to, you know, um, if you are a faith based person listening to this, you realize this, we're supposed to study his word, meditate on his word so that when we need it, it's there. And I would love to tell you that I'm one of these <laughs> together moms uh, who Oh, I can just suddenly recite scripture and I have knowing where the passage is. 
but I don't. I'm just like anybody and I, I struggle sometimes and my emotions can get the best of me. But this was such a gift to have that quick piece that does surpass all understanding. And, you know, I knew I would talk with Cassie later about this. She, she was 21. She wasn't 12. Or even if she was 12, I would talk to her about it. But it wasn't now. I needed to kind of get my act together. I needed to head down to x-ray and kind of brace myself for that. But while I was sitting in the waiting room, my husband was allowed to go in with her. And we always have to use, I guess we call it a fainting protocol, right? Yep. We have a specific fainting protocol in place. Some fainting happens from POTS, but we also find the other form of dysautonomia that we know is going on is um, neurocardiogenic syncope. That means that when my pain levels get too high, I pass out. So we have a specific protocol in place whenever I have to have x-rays or procedures done or anything. We just, we have a very specific plan. So we were following that protocol. Yeah, because no matter how well-meaning staff is, they, they just don't get it. And um, and I'm a fast dropper too. It's not like this bang, slow, like, bang. kind she of She falls thing. dead is what I tell people. I'm like, she just falls down dead. And uh, yeah. so <laughs> it's alarming and it's a whole other subject for another day. Is yeah. We kind of all have a little trauma around that. And actually some of your worst injuries are from those falls. Yes. Yep. Unfortunately, it wasn't so much the fainting, it's the tile floor or whatever she landed on. So, you know, I did have a few moments just praying that that would go okay. And it actually went quite well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Thank, thank, thank goodness. You know, again, I, I jotted down in my phone. I just had my little iPhone and I opened up one of the notes apps and I just quickly jotted down, you know, because I, I wanted to think on this more and, and understand. And there are going to be times with illnesses that you just, you just never going to understand. You're not going to mm-hmm. understand the why. I ask a lot of the how. Okay, h- how am I supposed to do this? Someone asked me, I, I had told them that I'll often ask, what next? <laughs> and someone said, oh, don't ever ask that. What next? Like, I said, no, it's not what next in this anxious, oh, what next? What's going to happen? It's okay, what next, God? Like, what am I supposed to do next? And very often in these moments, it is what next as in the next 60 seconds, mm-hmm. the next 60 minutes. Uh, not to sound cliche, but it's what Cassie and I, especially kind of as a, as a team mm-hmm. through and uh, my husband and of course his family, we all, also adopted it. It's just sometimes when you are in so much pain or mentally struggling, whatever it is, no matter what the illness or what the situation, you just get through that minute, you know, those seconds, those hours. Um, and, then and, and it's true. That philosophy has really been a huge part of my life. And it's even a huge part of my marriage now, because there are times that, you know, I start thinking about the what ifs and I start going down, well, what if this doesn't work? And what are we going to do if, and all these other things. And Jared will sometimes just look at me and he goes, okay, just right now, here's what we're going to do. In this moment, this is what we're going to do. In another hour, we'll evaluate. In a half an hour, we'll evaluate. So I always talk about how we just take things spoon by spoon. And we just kind of are like, okay, let's just do one thing at a time. And that, I think, helps keep some of the hysteria and almost anxiety from taking over in a lot of ways. Definitely. And I think with this consults, as many people who have had many doctor's appointments you know, you take that for what it is, you take that information, you process it, you ask more questions, anything with a surgery, honestly, unless it's like getting a mole removed, I'm not going to tell you to get a second opinion anyway. Um, insurance usually covers that. So that was something where it was, it gave us a lot to think about. It was yep. a, we don't have to do this right now. Thank goodness. Uh, but decisions are pretty fast. Yeah. But there was a bit of, you know, a lull because I had asked him, I had just said now, Is there any way that this is just going to resolve with enough PT? You know, like, what can I do to prevent needing this surgery? He was just like, this is your bone structure. Like, this is not just the EDS. He's like, you also have hip dysplasia and it's not going to get better unless you do surgery. So he was like, you can wait on surgery if you want and the pain is manageable enough. And, you know, I had a really good brace that I still use now that, has kept it from going out as often, but it was one of those things where he just, you know, said, you're going to need it eventually, but you can wait if you want. And, you know, it, it is something I'm actually, I met with the other surgeons who do that different parts of the surgery because it's more than one thing. And I am technically cleared for the surgery. And it was one of those things where we've just said we would like to wait. But I mean, that that definitely was a bit of a heavy piece to that appointment, though, was this wasn't just going to resolve. 
Right. And I think we're people who look at the whole picture. I think that's really important. And I kept thinking of the post-op side recovery, you know, that could be just, there's just gonna be so many factors when you're dealing with chronic pain and all the issues that she has. It's not just a simple, oh, well, we'll just give her some pain meds and narcotics, have her in overnight, and then she goes home. Everything is amplified. Her pain levels amplify from the smallest thing. She potentially needed her wisdom teeth out. And I just remember going, oh, I don't know. And ironically, <laughs> her brother and sister are going to need wisdom teeth out soon, too. And I'm like, well, Jay, do we just do the whole shebang? And we're, we're just in a time of <laughs> suffering in my household. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's a, what well, we do use a lot of humor, like we mm-hmm. do now. It's still, it's, it's more layers to consider when you have a chronic yeah. illness something still be determined. We have certain things that need to be in place and they're so far. A lot of things are in place. Yeah, so far they are. And it's just, I always say there's no really good time to have surgery. Uh, There's always something you're going to miss, some life event, or you're going to be impacted in some way, no matter how healthy you are going into it. But there are better times to have it than others. Yeah. And so we definitely want to take careful consideration. But I mean, we have so much to be like, has this appointment happened a year and a half ago? Yeah, I was just looking at that. Yeah, it was like a year and a half ago, I think, maybe even almost two years. So we look back on this whole situation now with so much clarity, I think. But I mean, it was something that when we went home from that appointment, we all were wrestling Mm -hmm. with what had happened. And I don't remember the situation or why it had come about, um, but you had come up to my room maybe like a week or two after the appointment. I hadn't been in the moment stuck on that whole garbage, um, just, you you know, um, phrase. And it had just started kind of hitting me in little ways. Like, wow, is my body really garbage? Like, is this just how life is going to be? I just live with a body that's garbage all the time. And you would come up to my room and as we were talking about it, we don't remember why we, it could have been just to talk about dinner. I don't even know what it was about. Or sometimes it are those those little God moments where you just know you need to. Yeah. yeah, So we don't know which one it was, but you would come up and I remember you actually, because you wrote about this day in your bathroom Bible moment that you had, you like jotted down some notes, you know, you ended up sharing them with me, which was a really big deal because you're a more private person when it comes to stuff that you've written or been meditating on. I'm very private in that way. Yeah. Even doing a podcast is a big deal for me. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, it was just one of those things where I remember her just going, no, like Cassie, you are not garbage. And you explained to me that you were wrestling with this. Like it wasn't just me. Like I wasn't alone in this mental battle that I was having. And you were just like, look, I made you like you were made in me. I didn't make garbage. God didn't make garbage. Like you are not garbage. And then she brought up, you know, Psalm 139, 14, which says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And it was just kind of one of those all right, you know, like, let's continue on. And yeah, and I would say a year and a half later, thinking of that, I know you have it open in front of you, I don't, but I need to read the end of that again. Um, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I was like, oh, let's just sit on that part of I know that full well. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like I, I, I joked with my friends many times over the years when we're, we're trying to figure out maybe what we're supposed to do next, whether it's, um, new job or, or whatever it is that you're just not sure of. And I, I, I've joked with them many times that, you know, I want to be driving along the road and see that billboard says, do this dummy. Like I've told you, <laughs> I've given you multiple ways to understand this. And Deb, this is, this is it. <laughs> you know. But I think we need to think about in this context of, of making big decisions and dealing with chronic illness. We know that full well, like we know his works are not mistakes. But it is very easy when it's about ourselves or our loved one to doubt that. And I often um, also have a running joke with a friend. You can see that I do try to connect with other women and other fellowship and just people who are supportive and praying. And um, we both realized in different conversations that, you know, we give over to Jesus, whatever that burden is. I literally been on my knees just, you know, saying, okay, God, I, I leave this at the foot of the cross. I leave this to you. And somewhere along the way we get anxious and guess what? We sneak up and we take it back. 
We just, yeah, we snatch it. We just snatch it right back. You know, I'm, I'm just going to take a little part of that back. Well, yeah, and it's our way of basically saying, hey, God, so you know that thing that I was praying about that I really, really, really wanted you to do something about? Yeah, well, here's the thing. Your timing's not really working for me right now. <laughs> so because you're not doing something, even though you have infinite power and wisdom to do all things, I'm going to take it back and try to do it myself. And yeah, you're doing something. We just can't see exactly it. we don't understand and i guess um now this insight's coming to me just as we're speaking you know here it is a year and a half later and look at the insight that we have mm-hmm. and that we didn't have that and we're all kind of twisted and anxious and there's still some anxiety yeah um, it, you know you're never going to go into a huge decision like that and thinking well let's let's start a series of surgeries this is this is the date but there is so much more peace i would say One hundred percent. And, you know, we've met with the teams. We've said we really want to hold off as long as possible. But, you know, they they have brought it up to us. They're like, you know, if your other hip dislocates, like we have to start these. If, you know, there are there are a couple different scenarios where they're like, if X, Y, Z happens, this will have to take place. So I, I do think that, you know, that doesn't get any easier kind of just knowing, okay, well, the ball could drop at any moment and everything could change. But we do have so much peace in just knowing at least we've already, we understand what will happen. We already have thought through a lot of it as a family because it's not just Jared and I, you guys are involved heavily in my care and all of that. And, you know, it's one of those things where, because I think we're a year and a half out, if we have to go into this, I think we'll feel a lot better about it because we've had so much time to just sit on it and pray over it and yeah, you know and I, think, I mean, yeah, and I think too um, with dysautonomia and all of the fainting and all, all of the issues that go with that, we have a better understanding of that. We have mm-hmm. a practitioner who not only believes in it, basically diagnosed it mm-hmm. and you know created a treatment plan around that. Uh, you don't qualify right now for any of his clinical trials mm-hmm. uh, because of some of the deconditioning, but knowing that he's working with hundreds of patients in this field and. The neat thing is when I asked him, so when are you going to wrap up? Because as a nurse, I wanted his research study. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm never going to be done. Like, I'm never going to be wrapping up. And I said, no, I mean this particular study. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that should be published in a couple <laughs> months. But to hear him say, oh, I'm never going to be done, it was just... Well, it just brought uh, so much hope. Like, there was yes. so much peace in that of just knowing that you have someone on your side that's like, no, we're never going to stop fighting to figure this out. Like, we're not just going to throw in the towel when it gets too hard. Like, we are going to just do this. And, you know, for anybody who right now is dealing with those difficult medical decisions, whether you are the patient, you are the parent, caregiver, whatever it is, I just encourage you to give yourself time to wrestle with it, give it to God and meditate on it because we would not have come this far without doing all of those things. And, you know, as we said, we're a year and a half out of this situation and this conversation that took place, but it took us quite a while to get to this current place that we're in now. Yeah. And I think if you have uh, an issue that can be progressive too, that's hard. I mean, I would say there's some ways that you're better in a year and a half, Mm -hmm. but there's other ways that your health has declined in a year and a half too. And that's hard to see as well. Um, But you have to keep it in perspective and you know, I, I always hesitate to sound cliche, but it could always be worse because mm-hmm. it can be. And I would also caution you, you don't have to be a nurse to read a research study. There's so many, so many ways to access information about whatever your disease, or your concern is. And I would say be really, really careful on some of the social media pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found great hope in some of them. There's, some, uh, there's a wonderful parent that I connected with who she was in a film about rare diseases and it actually was Cassie's diagnosis. And I just reached out to her cause I realized she was in new England too. And she's been fabulous because she's, you know, she's got two daughters um, with very similar diagnoses to Cassie's, but she's also really educating herself and trying to be an advocate. And some of the groups that she's in, I ended up just joining online. Um, but there's some scary stuff on there too. And, and some, it, some of it's it not accurate. Overwhelming. Yeah. And some of it's just, well, that's not even true. You know, people are um, potentially attributing every possible symptom or issue to that disease. And it could be related to that, but also just be that you would have that anyway, if you even didn't have that Mm -hmm. disease or diagnosis. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but 
I would have liked someone to have told me that years ago, you know, when you're researching information yeah. and you're just in tears over your potential health concern or your child or your friend or your loved one. So just proceed with caution would be my advice on that. Yeah. The other thing that I would definitely say and kind of touch on is, you know, I work really hard, I think now to love the broken body that I have. Um, A lot of the times I'll say, um, you know, this is the broken body that I've been blessed with. And there are times that people are like, I don't understand how you can say that. I, I don't understand. Like that does not make any sense. It took me years. I mean, this upcoming year will be 10 years. So it has taken a very long time to get to that place. But, you know, we have so much compassion for other people when they're going through things. And even for when we were were talking about animals and the earth and just all these things. And yet we give ourselves so little compassion in return. So I think, you know, yes, it is hard to love a body that is progressively failing you. But this is the body that you have been blessed with. And we're just going to continue to do our best to take care of it and love it for all that it is. Yeah, I think it is difficult to have compassion for ourselves. We think of all these important causes and things that we care about. and We are our own worst critics. We we treat ourselves worse than we would treat someone we really love. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. My husband and I have had to really work hard too um, to just maintain a strong marriage and say, well, wait a minute, like we can't let this take us down. You know, we had two other children too to think about so you're sometimes pouring so much into your family and your spouse and you know never mind your job you can sometimes lose track of yourself and I used to think it was so cliche when they talk about um putting the oxygen mask on yourself first before or they'll say oh you can't pour from an empty cup you know (laughs) all of these things you know fill in the blank you know what but it is true we do need to be taking care of ourselves for me, I make sure that that's not just a physical thing. That's also a spiritual thing, mental thing. Even being here in Maine, um, you know, I'm looking out the window right now at these gorgeous trees, which is ironic because I'm allergic to every single one of them out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allergic to everything that grows this time of year except for children. But, you know, it's still, like, they took my allergy medicine and here I am. But it, I mean, just taking the time to pause and reflect and think about something that, that's good for you. And I'm one of these people, I always have my phone out and I'm like, oh, you're always taking pictures, but... I'm not taking pictures of people. I am contemplating and meditating and just on the beauty around me and that God could create that. And if God can create all these magnificent things out here in nature that we're looking at, like, look what he can do in you. So I don't know if that's Mm. helpful. I hope it is. The whole point of this podcast was to help other people who may Mm -hmm. be struggling and um, illness can be extremely isolating. I hear heartbreaking cases in one way or another every week and the ministry work that we do and just even my work as a nurse too. Um, I guess I'm heartbroken regularly for people and the lack of compassion that people have, but I just pray that you take a step to take care of yourself and that maybe listening to this podcast was one part of that. I know I listen to podcasts regularly and it's something that helps me quite a bit. Yeah. And we've been so blessed to be given the platform through living the chronic illness life. You know, I think we've enjoyed growing with everyone alongside us and being able to use what could have wrecked so many things to bring us closer together. I think it's been really important, but man, I, I feel so blessed by this conversation and I think it was so healthy for me to even look back on this and just mm-hmm. reflect on how far we've come because you can't move forward unless you know where you've been. And I just think that's so important, but I'm so glad that we had time to just chat today for all my friends that are wondering, yes, my mom will be back on hopefully once a month and we will just get to share about all the things. And she just has to pin me down. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She literally is like, mom, mom, I need you to look, look, open your calendar right now. Like we need to get this. done. (laughs) Okay. Well, it's kind of hard to drag her out of her garden too. Well, I'm not there so, yet. We're, you know, it's New England. So, yeah, it's it's kind of a mess. I know, but what I'm saying is we're getting into that spring season, or really spring-summer season, which really means, well, you know. Maybe, maybe we'll record out there. I, we, I participate in a community garden that's walking distance from my house, and we really try to give back to the neighborhood that way. And I don't know, maybe we'll record in the yeah. garden. You'll hear some birds, whatever, but that's always a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. And of course, my neighborhood, I'm just going to put it right out there. You're going to hear potentially someone driving by in bad language though so (laughs) that that might not work okay we'll we'll work on that so stay tuned yeah life in ministry life in ministry nice to meet you all all right see you guys next week